Humans have always told stories of the tall, dark man in the wilderness. Sort of like a shadow at the edge of our vision. In 1922, a sideshow owner by the name of John Gadsudski purchased a recently deceased surgeon's cabinet of curiosities. In it, he found deformed fetuses, two-headed pets, and other medical oddities. But he also discovered a large, mysterious skull. The surgeon's widow told Gadsudski that a man named Daniel Mayer had apparently sold the skull to the surgeon to cover a debt at some point in the 1870s. And the skull had remained in the surgeon's possession for the intervening years. John Gedsuski put the skull on display at Sunnyside Pavilion as the man-ape of the North. But his sideshow was not the great success he'd been hoping for. Concerned that his poor revenues were a reflection of the general conservatism of the populace of the city, he decided to move on, and he was lost to history, as was the skull. We'd hardly know about his existence if it weren't for this photograph by Samuel Parr, who was documenting the typography of the period. So this is the story. In the year 1867, a Scottish trapper by the name of Daniel Mayer hired a young man named William Helm to guide him through the Canadian wilderness. Now, unbeknownst to Daniel, the man he had hired to guide him on his trek, William Helm, was a confidence man, a petty thief, and the son of a hanged felon. Boone Helm, William Helm's father, had come to be known as the Kentucky Cannibal by the time he was put to death as he watched a fellow gang member hang, legs kicking wildly on a rope beside him. Boonhelm was heard to say, kick away, Jack, my turn next. I'll be in hell with you in a minute. Boone was a Confederate to the last and his final words were, every man for his principles Hurrah for Jeff Davis. Let her rip. So, the son of a Confederate cannibal and the melancholic brother of one of the first great naturalists set off north early in the autumn of 1867. You see, to Dan Meir, this was an exotic and foreign land. Meir dreamt of observing the land's vast wilderness. He was a reader of Emerson, and brother of the author and naturalist John Meir. From the beginning, the journey was beset by strangeness. Meir and Helm were spooked by occasional sharp, shrill cries coming from the woods around them. Mare swore it to be unlike the cries of any creature known to him or humankind. Later, the two men came upon unusual footprints along a riverbank. William assumed they must be the footprints of a bear. But after an examination of the footprints, Mare remarked to his guide, William, if this is a bear, then it has been walking upon two legs. William Helm had never been in this part of the world before. And within a few weeks, he had gotten the pair completely lost, but continued to behave as if he were sure of their course. When Mare realized they were lost, he took charge and tried to lead them back to civilization by instinct alone. Too late. Winter was upon them. So, 
Suffering from hunger and cold, the pair took refuge in a cave. They would end up spending the entire winter there. They went through their supplies quickly. By necessity, Mayor and William began to dine on grubs and roots. Next, they were forced to eat their shoes and whatever other articles of clothing they could spare. After that, the hunger began, and with it, delirium. Both men later admitted to coming close to committing an act of savagery upon the other. William, in a letter to his mother, wrote, if that beast had not come along when it did, I would have had no choice but to slaughter my companion. The men became aware of something watching them from the cave's mouth. It was almost twice the size of a man and covered in reddish fur. They seized the opportunity. Thanks to Daniel Mayer's knowledge, the pair fed on the creature through the rest of winter. They finally broke shelter in early spring. William Helm had managed to save his last cigar through the entire ordeal, hiding it from Mayer through all their suffering. And Helm smoked it on the trek back to civilization. Upon their return, the two men never spoke again. Daniel Mayer lived out a reclusive and solitary life. He rarely wrote or spoke of the winter of 1867. Now, unfortunately, William Helm continued his criminal activities. And like his father before him, was sent to the gallows. He'd stabbed a young man to death over a small loan. One of his last acts was to write a letter to his mother, to whom he had always been greatly devoted. And in the letter, Helm tried to give his mother a sense of what had led him to his fate. He told her the story of the winter of 1867 and claimed that the legends were true. Immediately after William Helm was executed, his body was given to the local medical college where it was dissected. No one saw fit to claim his skull for a trophy.